Hello and welcome. This is episode 169 of the Chills of Will podcast. What a pleasure to be joined today by Justin Tinsley. And just a little bio, there's a lot, a lot, a lot, but um, we'll fill in some of those gaps. Justin Tinsley is the author of It Was All a Dream, Biggie and the World That Made Him, and host of ESPN's 30 for 30 Nipsey Hustle original podcast called The King of Crenshaw. He is sports and culture senior reporter at Disney's Anscape, formerly The Undefeated, and weekly guest on ESPN's Around the Horn. How are you today? How you doing? My, my man, 169 episodes. That's in, that's incredible, man. <laughs> that's incredible. I'm glad to be here. That. It's been it's been um it's been crazy. It's been to be able to uh, talk to like people like you across the screen has just been really surreal. So thank yeah, you man. for that and thanks for being on. Hey, thank you for this platform and thank you for this opportunity, man. I'm I'm really looking forward to this discussion. And you, sorry for the sun beaming on me right, right quick, but you I know. mean, I feel like it's a, it's an omen or something, you know. <laughs> hey, hope so, <laughs> hope so. I need to Does go. Does that follow you around all the time? It follows you around all the time. Uh I wish, I wish it did, but if, for right now, it will. So, <laughs> yeah. The um, in the acknowledgments, you know, one of the main things we'll talk about is is the book about about Biggie, and in the acknowledgments, you talk about um, you know, beautiful tribute to your grandmother. You talked about how you know she. I guess in the fifties, I want to say in, in Louisiana, maybe it was a Loyola university. Uh, Xavier university. university. Yeah. In Louisiana. Yep. I knew yeah, yeah. Catholic in one, New right? Orleans. Yep. In New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, that she really had, you know, had wanted to go into nutrition. I don't know if that was like as a scientist or a writer, mm -hmm. but like, it just really made me think about, you know, all the, the shoulders that, that we all stand on the shoulders that you stand yeah. on, you know, obviously because yeah. of racism and bias as a, as a black woman, you, this is what you wrote about just in a sense. Mm -hmm. or so. But I wonder, like, who's on whose shoulders you stand, and that's not just the the family members, but like, I mean, who were you like growing up? Who were you reading? Who, um, sports Ooh. writers or not, who really you know inspires you? Man, that's wow. That's an incredible question to start off with, bro. Um, <laughs> so growing up, I knew you know we were talking you know beforehand about basketball, you know the Kings and Arco and just yeah. things like that. I like most kids who grew up in the late eighties and nineties, you know, I worshiped the ground like Michael Jordan walked on, Same. but I knew very, very early on that I was not going to be Michael Jordan, the basketball player. I, I learned that very early on. And, but one thing that always interests me, bro, like one thing that always like captivated my attention were was storytelling, like being able to like, not, not not necessarily say, hey, Michael Jordan is really good at basketball. Like mm. anybody can see that. But here's the story beyond the story. So, you know, I grew up reading The Source magazine. I grew up reading Vibe, you know, Rolling Stone, Sports Illustrated. And I always, I always enjoyed the pros in those, in those magazines. And, you know, my mom and my grandmother, their former, uh, school teachers you know my grandmother taught uh earth science in high school and middle school for over 40 years and my mother is a retired speech pathologist and assistant principal so they hammered home the notion of of reading and education to me early on and one of one of the first books i remember reading when i was like six or seven uh was the jordan rules Oh yeah. By, yeah. By, by Sam Smith. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? And I, I didn't really understand everything I was reading in there, but I'm like, wow, this is a look into Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen mm -hmm. and, you know, just the bulls period in ways that I don't see on TV in ways that I don't see every day. And I was like, I really enjoyed this. So again, I read all those magazines. I read all those books and you know, people like Stuart Scott, who was a huge influence on me from, you know, Sports Center, Robin Roberts. Uh, I just I've always been involved in storytelling and I knew that, like, I'll never be able to make music the way that some of these people do or mm. uh, place definitely play sports the way that some of these people do. But I love to tell these stories. I love talking to people about these stories. And so those are the the it's a much longer story but we can get into it in later parts of the conversation yeah. but those are the sh shoulders that i stand on because they you know those people made it possible for me to even think that something that what i get a chance to do now is possible hmm. 
I remember two two stories stand out for me from Jordan Rules. Um, yeah, and and I I just thought about this right now, but I love the shout out. At least two shout outs in the in the Vicky book, I think, to Craig Hodges. Mm-hmm. Man, mm-hmm. that's kind yeah. of a deep, deep cut right there. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. So since we're since we're having these conversations, uh, one of the more powerful stories I did in 2020. I obviously we all remember the year 2020, hmm. which feels like yesterday, but also feels like a lifetime ago. Definitely. You know, my wife and one of my best friends, we were just talking about it at lunch earlier today. But one of the stories I did that year was on Craig Hodges. And it was shortly mm-hmm. after the, you know, the George Floyd murder and, you know, the world was reacting and the way that the world was reacting. And I grew up and I remember Craig Hodges. I remember that dude being like a sharpshooter. And mm-hmm. then I remember dude just disappearing. Right. You know what I mean? Because I, I, at that point, I was like eight or nine. And I I didn't know what happened to him. And one thing led to another. I found his contact and and I told him I wanted to interview him just about the George Floyd type thing at George Floyd situation. But that conversation turned into, I asked him about his life and he was very open and very charismatic and very vulnerable in terms of why he felt it was necessary to live the life that he has and why he doesn't regret anything and things of that nature. So he was, he was an incredibly savvy, brilliant and phenomenal guy to speak to. I've interviewed a lot of people over the course of my you know career, which I still hope has decades and decades more to yeah. blossom, but he was, he was just truly phenomenal. And I, and it always stuck with me. So when I was writing that book, mm-hmm there were a lot of situations or a lot of topics in there that I spoke about that I spoke about with him. And I was like, well, yeah, you know, just he remembers when Fred Hampton got killed. Hmm. You know, he remembers when, uh, you know, a certain, you know, incident with the police happened or a riot took place in this city or whatever the case may be. Like he remembered that. And I was just like, yo, I, I, I don't even know if Craig Hodges read the book. I don't even know if Craig Hodges knows I wrote a book, you know, <laughs> but like it, that, that interview, it meant so much to me that I was like, you know what? I at least got to make a, a, a homage to him. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm glad you picked that up <laughs> because nobody's ever said that to me. So I'm glad you caught it. <laughs> well, man, I mean, I, I think of him like at the racks at the three point contest. I mean, like I, like you said, I mean, that, that was a sharp shooter. If there's ever a sharp shooter, I mean, he could. Yeah. He could yeah. Yeah. And the, one of the wild things is, uh, for anybody who's listening, go back and watch the 1993 uh, three-point contest. Craig Hodges is in there. Craig Hodges doesn't play for a team. It's the um, first and only time that a quote-unquote free agent yeah. participated in the in any all-star activity. Whoa. Yeah, it's, it's nuts. It's on YouTube. You can go watch it yeah. right now. Well, I mean, you know, I remember from the Jordan rules is that it was like, I think, um, like, the first Iraq war operation desert storm had just started yep. and he was, he was saying something like, man, like if, if I, if we were to back up right now, you know, like Michael Jordan's the main, could be a main target. You know what I mean? He'd be like representative of like American, you know, quote unquote exceptionalism or something like that. So I remember yeah. that from Jordan rules. Yep. I remember, I think I remember um, them talking about how Jordan would get women that would just like lay under his tires, part, part obsessive part, maybe get a little paycheck, you know, if they get hurt mm-hmm. or something like that, you know, I'm like, man, that's, yep. That's um, yeah. success or something or power or something. Yeah, you know, it, right? it, it's something. If you, you, something. you hit the nail, it's something. I don't know what it is. I, I don't I don't want that. I, I'll take the money, but I won't right? take the, everything that comes with it. In that case, sure. my lack of specificity may be a good thing on that word. I, you know, something. I don't like that word usually as a writer, but, you know. <laughs> no, no, it, it's perfect for this for this case, for sure. There you go. Um, so as you got into, you know, high school and college um, and began choosing more of your reading, I mean, I know you did as a kid too, but like stuff in school that you had to read, who were you, who were you reading? I mean, even up until today, like who are some of those contemporary, however you want to judge contemporary writers who just throw you? Ooh, so one of the first books, and I have it actually tattooed on my arm. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, really? it's right here. Yeah. Oh, uh it says oh, yeah. only only the mistakes have been mine. Mm-hmm. That is 
the last sentence from Malcolm X's autobiography, mm. which I still say to this day, it's probably it, not probably it is the most important book I've ever read. And it's the mm. book I try to reread every like four to five years when I find myself in a different, I guess you could say space in yeah. life. Yeah. Um, because I feel like just beyond him being Malcolm X and beyond his role in the civil rights movement, I, I, I just feel like he's, he's like honestly the most fascinating person to ever live hmm. you know and so the the autobiography of michael max was was great um to get a chance to to work with danielle smith hmm. after reading her work and being like a fanboy of her work for hmm. so for so many years to work with her at the undefeated was maybe like the crowning achievement of my career wow yeah like i learned she's somebody that i you know i i've always enjoyed how she told stories and i always enjoy how she humanized you know the topics that she covered especially like the uncomfortable topics mm. and i learned so much from her so to call her an editor but really to call her i can't even call her a friend because it's deeper than that mm. um Danielle Smith, like, if she ever listens to this, like, I really, really want her to know that, like, yo, she changed my life in so many ways. And I'll, I'll never, you know, we both love Tupac, you know, like, so ain't no way I can pay her back. But my plan is to show her that I understand. Ooh. And you know what I mean? And I, I love Danielle Smith and, mm. you know, her husband, Elliot Wilson. I read him for so many years. I, I would tell him this story all the time. Like when I was in high school, uh, I was working at the grocery store uh, down the street from um, my mom and my grandma's house. And he was the editor in chief of Double uh, XL at that point. Mm. And he was YN. And I used to worship those magazines. And I, I loved Elliot. And, and all the swagger and the charisma and like the 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 brilliant pros that he would bring to the game. So the fact that I can call those two people just like family members now, mm -hmm. like I got their numbers in my phone. Like Danielle ain't really the greatest at texting. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like if I if I'm being held You're hostage, your business I, out there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know what I mean? If I'm <laughs> if I'm being held hostage. I you won't text Danielle, but I will call her and she'll pick up. <laughs> but like Danielle and Elliot, like those those two people, I read them a lot growing up. Um, Ralph Wiley, mm. the the late great Ralph Ralph rest Wiley, in oh, yeah. rest in peace. Like, yeah. just I mean, just beautiful the way he just like I, if I'm one eighth of the writer that Ralph Wiley was, then I will have done something you know, respectable with my career. Mm. And I'm sorry for all this sun getting in my face. No, I, no, no. I, I I really got my blinds closed, believe it or not. Um oh he was a must read man. Sports yeah he he, he was yeah. he was a must read like uh but you know I could keep going but there there's so many different people uh it's just you know I I don't even want to start naming names beyond that like I uh, well one one I can name uh is one of my best friends in the world, David Dennis, mm -hmm. David Dennis Jr., mm -hmm. uh, published author, critically acclaimed yes. of the movement made us. Uh, our books honestly came out on the same day. That's right. And uh, he's always been somebody that I feel like he's such a better writer than I am. Mm -hmm. And the fact that like he sees me on his level will never not like... Mm -hmm. I don't even know if I can curse on here, but go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. yeah, it will never not shock the fuck out of me. Huh. You know what I mean? Like, I think David is somebody that that really moves me and really he he motivates me. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I can keep going, but those names definitely yeah. in particular, they stand yeah. out. I know that you have great love for HBCUs and Hampton, yeah. right? Where you went where you went to school, right? Yes, yeah, sir. Hampton University. The real H U. There you go. I think it was on. I think it was on your Twitter. Or I don't know where I, I saw it, but you posted like a really like, like such a cool tribute to like HBCUs in general and to Hampton. And oh I, yeah, I, remember, yeah. I was able to share that with one of my students who has a family history, and she was loving it. Was but it like, a video? Yeah, it was like maybe like a three or four minute clip. 
Yeah, yeah. So it, that was something that I did for. Yeah, it was on HBCU Homecomings. Right. Uh, it, it was for Outside the Lines. It was. They wanted yeah. me to do a video essay on it. Yep. So I wonder, kind of a combined question, but like about the the influence of Hampton on you, as well as just like when you really started to say, "Man, I could be a Ralph Wiley. I can be somebody that people read and people really enjoy my work." Man, HBCUs like. I'm I'm we're not having this conversation right now. If 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 it's you know up to HB, if it if it's not HBCUs, mm-hmm. if HBCUs aren't in the picture. I grew up around historically black colleges my entire life. Yeah. My my grandfather, my great grandfather, my grandfather, and my mother, they all went to South Carolina State University in Orangeburg, South Carolina. My grandmother went to Xavier down in New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, you know, my uncle um, he went to Virginia State for a bit. And, you know, my grandfather, he just he was in he was in coaching in HBCUs for a long time. Mm. And he's in the CIAA Hall of Fame as an athletic director. Really? So, yeah, I, I grew up around black. Co- I mean, I knew black colleges existed before before any other colleges. You mm. know what I mean? Before, you know, the Power Five and, you know, all that type of stuff. So I, I kind of knew early on that I was going to go to a black college and. I wanted to go to one where I could really cement my own legacy. Mm. You know, my mom really wanted me to go to South Carolina State, and I love South Carolina State. But I wanted to go somewhere. It was like, nah, I'm the first one to go here. And Hampton Hampton just happened to be that. And it was during my fall semester of my senior year at Hampton, I took this intro to blogging class. It was fall Mm. 07. And I was like, man, what? But like, what the hell is blogging? Like, I don't really care. Like, I just, I need a grade. You know what I mean? I just need something to just pad my GPA. And like, yeah. I graduate in a couple of months. That turned out, that turned out to be the most important class I ever took at Hampton. Wow. Yeah, because it taught me how to create a website. It taught me how to like publish stories and publish whatever the hell I wanted to publish. So when I graduated in May 2008, and if you remember where the world was in 2008, that's mm-hmm. right when the recession hit. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't find a job. I couldn't do anything. Uh, but at Hampton, I was known as the guy that had all the new music. Mm-hmm. You know, I always had the new mixtapes, whether it was a new Wayne mixtape, new Jeezy, the Dream. Um, you know, whoever was popping at that moment, I I always had the new music. So, so once we graduated, space was, what space was that? Sorry, like, you know, because I, I yeah. was like, I was like Blog a spot. Lobster. Yeah, so uh so download music. That was Why the wire, like that was Lime, yeah, that was the LimeWire Kazaa era. Okay, Kazaa, yeah, yeah. So yeah I guess I yeah, think yeah. Napster changed the Kazaa, right? Maybe it changed the I name think so. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bear Share and all that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, now we're really in the weeds. I'll just say, is the statute of um, limitations still around, though? Are we? Yeah. I hope not, because <laughs> Lord knows, I thought they were going to knock on my door for years, <laughs> especially the way I was downloading music, bro. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so once we graduated, you know, myself and my friends, we dispersed all around the country. You know, people would hit me up all the time, like, yo, where can I get the new music from? Where can I do this? And I was like, well, I got tired of sending it to people individually. Mm-hmm. So I just created my own website. And I was like, yo, come here and just get your music. Yeah. And one day, one of my friends hit me and he was like, hey, we went to Hampton together. And he was like, Tens, yo, I'm loving your website. I go there every day. And, you know, I, I started to see the traffic build on the website, too, because mm-hmm. I'm a competitive person. Once I see something working, it's like, all right, well, how can we make it better? How can we uh-huh. do this, that, and the third? And he hit me he was like, Tens, I really like, I, I love your site. I love your site. I download the music there every day. But, like, I think you need to post less music, but you need to write more. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's dumb. Yeah. Like, like, why would I do that? Like, he was like, no, I really think what you have to say on things is like, really, I don't, I don't, I don't read it anywhere else. Okay. And also, so what if it takes more time? You ain't got a job. It ain't <laughs> like you got to be to work in like ouch. 20 minutes. Yeah. And I'm like, well, Point yeah, two. ouch, but <laughs> also true. And I started doing it more and more. And I was like, yo, I really love writing. I really love doing this. And to make, uh, I've, I'm already long winded as it is on this answer, but to make a long story much, much shorter, that's how I really became involved in writing online. Mm. And the one thing led to another and I'm on your show on the 169th episode. Yeah, good, good memory. <laughs> um, the Anscape, you know, which was, which was undefeated, did, mm-hmm. did it start around 2015? Is that what you're saying? 
So yeah, I start I I started at ESPN in January 2015. Okay. And you know, I was hired, I was hired by Jason Whitlock. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was brought in as the young writer. And, you know, I didn't have, you know, I didn't have the the Times, the LA or New York Times mm-hmm. under my belt, or Washington Post, or Boston Globe, or Dallas Morning News, or Chicago Tribune, or whatever, you know, these really established like grandfatherly type right you know institutions are and like brilliant institutions institutions that you would love to have on your resume right. i just didn't have that mm-hmm. i was blogging i was i was freelancing and all that mm-hmm. so they took a chance on me and i i was supposed to be groomed to be this this next great writer to come under this umbrella and of course you, you, you we all understand the leadership changes changes that happen at uh the undefeated and eventually mm-hmm. Anscape. And, and so by january 2016 kevin merida had taken over mm-hmm. uh the undefeated and he obviously he was the managing editor of the washington post before he came to the undefeated and we had a conversation and i was in la and he was like yo would you be willing to move back east because I want the the headquarters to be in DC. And you know, I was living life in LA. I I loved LA. You know what I mean? Everything LA everything had to offer. I mean everything. <laughs> so and I'm like, you know what? I'm living a great life out here on the West Coast, but I need to get my career in order. Like I'm 29. I'm almost 30 at this point. I need yeah. to get this shit in order. And I moved back to the East Coast and yeah, it it was one of the best decisions of my life. So you had to say goodbye to Sharkies. Ooh, had to say goodbye to Sharkies. Had to say goodbye to Roscoe's. Had to say goodbye <laughs> yeah. to my LA Cafe and a um yeah. salmon tacos. Ooh, oh. I need to get back out to LA. So I know, yeah, right. I know, right. Yeah. Oh man. Um. So I'm actually 